Let's go back to plasticity. If you remember, in general, we have in plasticity modeling, you know, everything we've solved or looked at so far is just elastic as far as, you know, things we actually, or at least in the next homework assignment that I ask you to compute solutions to, right? But in plasticity, now we have some nonlinear behavior, okay? So in one dimension, what, you know, roughly what the tangent stiffness matrix is, is, you know, at any given point, so at a given strain, say this value, then we'd compute the tangent stiffness and it would be roughly that. You know, later on, after further deformation, again, this is, this is in one dimension, right? So the stiffness, remember, is the change in force with respect to deformation. And stress and strain, right, st stress is just normalized force. Strain is a function of displacement, right? So <clears throat> there's one thing. So basically, what to solve a plasticity problem, nothing changes up until you're in the plastic regime. Right? Everything's just the same. But once you go into the plastic regime, now you have to perform this lineariza linearization, okay? And because we have this return algorithm, remember, in plasticity, like if you remember from the notes, like in J2 plasticity, you have this yield surface out here, and you can't be outside of it, right? So the actual iteration we'll use, and I'll talk a little bit about it, is that we effectively we compute a trial stress, right? So we assume the step is elastic. When I, say, I, I use the word step here, meaning it could be a step in time, but it could also be time could also be fictitious. So a lot of times when we solve these type of problems, because we have to use this iterative procedure, we increment the load. Okay, so we don't, you know, if we're interested in the deformation after some load is applied, we can't always just apply the load in one step, you know, go from zero to 10, okay? Because we have to, if, especially if it goes nonlinear, it goes plastic in somewhere in between, right? Our linearization is not gonna be very accurate if we just jump all the way to 10, and we're not gonna get a converged solution. So what we have to do is we have to go from one to 10 in steps of one, right? And so in that time, we talk about time steps or load steps, but they're fictitious. We've, we're not really talking about time until you actually have time dependence in your model, right? So when you, when you have inertia and you have you know, strain rate effects and other things, right? So here we're still talking about so-called quasi-statics, okay? So there's no time variables in our model, but we're gonna increment a fictitious time so that we can perform these linear linearization op op operations and, and get convergence, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a load step and we're gonna assume that it's completely elastic, okay? And we're gonna evaluate ourselves in stress space out here, and then we find that we're outside the yield surface, and that's not valid. We have to, you know, remember the state of stress is either on the yield surface or it's inside it. And so we have to return ourselves to the yield surface. You know, we typically do that. I, I kind of drew it in a funny way, but the one, only way we've talked about doing it so far is using a so-called associated flow, right? In that, in that way, the flow is normal to the yield surface, and so we're actually going to return ourselves right back in a normal direction to the yield surface, right on to the path, okay? And, and remember, this increment is proportional to some plastic multiplier lambda, okay? But when we derived everything previously, everything, nothing was discrete, right? We wrote differential equations for lambda, okay? But we, we can, in reality, we solve those differential equations in some discrete manner, and we have a choice in how we do it. And when we do our linear, this is the most important thing I want you to to remember from all this. When you 
do the linearization operation in a model that has plasticity, you, your linearization operation has to be consistent with the return algorithm. Okay? So what I mean by that, and I'll show, you know, I'll show some details in a second, but we cannot derive in closed form tangent stiffness matrices from a continuum model and implement those tangent stiffness matrices in a computational code and get quadratic convergence in a new iteration. Okay? In order to preserve quadratic convergence, your, your linearization has to be consistent with the return operation. Okay? So let's talk a little bit about the, re, you know, the return operation. Okay? So if you remember, or you go back and you look in your nodes, this, I'm going to start right from an equation that was in the note set on 925. Okay. We had this equation that the rate of E strength tensor, right? Well, let me, let me just write it down and I'll talk about what these terms are to remind you. Okay. So, you know, this first term, you have a tensor contracted with a tensor using summation convention, right? So tensor attracted with a tensor, you have a scalar, okay? So just even though I wrote two tensors, that's a scalar. This S is the scalar magnitude, so it's this thing, if you remember, right? So this is also a scalar, and then lambda is this plastic multiplier, the scalar that we're solving for. So go back if you're if you're curious where that equation came from. You know we derived it from this additive decomposition of the strain and all this stuff. And also keep in mind that this little e is the deviatoric part of the total strain rate. So we have the total strain rate, right? Uh, little e is the total strain rate minus one third. And Q is the, uh, th I'm just, this is all in the notes, but just to remind you. Q is the direction, right? So QIJ is SIJ over S. Right? Over the scalar magnitude. So it's a unit tensor in the direction of deviatoric stress. In other words, it's this direction right here. Okay, so again, that's just a differential equation. We have a lot of options in how we solve it, right? We can use Euler, we can use uh, Euler implicit, Euler explicit, Runge-Kutta methods. We can use any number of methods. Okay, the most common is to use Euler explicit or implicit methods. Okay, so in doing that, we're going to approximate our time derivatives as increment of, you know, so we're going to say that that the, the the rate of change of E is equal to an increment of E over dt. And where I wrote dt here, keep it in mind, this could be fictitious time, okay? And you'll see it, it doesn't even matter because it falls out in a second. You see, at least in this equation, the DTs can just cancel, right? So we have. And
So keep in mind that we're talking about a strain-driven model here. So this delta EIJ is given, right? We, we apply some displacements. We de apply a displacement increment. We compute the strains. So that's given. That's an input, right? So here's where the sort of algorithm comes in. We have a choice in, in how to define this delta S, right? We, we can say that it's delta S at a step in plus 1 minus S in This is this is one way to define it where n plus n step S N, that's that's the previous time step. We know the stress there. We already computed it, right? And in the extreme case, it's the very first time step in which the stress is either given as a boundary condition or it's zero. Right? If there's no deformation. Right? Right, so then So Sn is known, Sn plus 1 comes from our constitutive model. And it's, for the perfect plastic case, it's like square root of 2 thirds times y. And, it, and if you remember, that comes from the fact that in a uniaxial tension test, we have a stress tensor that looks like this. And therefore, the deviatoric stress tensor is this, and then therefore its magnitude is the square root 2 thirds times y. So when you compute the magnitude of this guy. Okay, now, that's for the perfectly plastic case, but in general, y can be a function of many other things. And I'll just show an example here where it's a function of the equivalent plastic strain and the equivalent plastic strain rate. Right? And if you remember from our definition of equivalent plastic strain rate, we can write that as 2 thirds lambda dot. Okay. So therefore, y at n plus 1, in general, would be y. And we have a choice here. We can, we can choose this to be we have a choice in how we choose how we evaluate y. We can evaluate it based on the equivalent plastic strain equivalent accumulated up until the previous time step. Okay. Or if we want to use a, an, an, impl an implicit method, remember, you know, the equivalent plastic strain at n plus 1, you could write as the equivalent plastic strain at n plus, which is known, right, this is known, plus the plastic strain rate over the step, sort of the strain rates kind of live in between n plus 1 and n, right? So the plastic strain rate over the step times delta t, right? And, and you could write that as... Uh, delta lambda, right? So square root of two-thirds delta lambda, right? So another way we could write this would be in terms of the plastic strain at step n plus 1 which is equal to 
the known plastic strain plus square root two thirds delta lambda So there's sort of two choices here. Here's choice one, and here's choice two, and they'll give you slightly different answers, okay? This uh, choice two would be the most accurate way, but it's also a little bit more computationally expensive, because now you, you're guaranteed to have an implicit equation in delta lambda, because you need, you're gonna solve delta lambda ultimately you're going to plug this back. You're going to plug this back into the equation and end up with something that looks like this. So if you, ch if you use it this way, and say your yield function here, right, this is the function that governs the hardening. If it's only linear, so if there's just like some h times this guy, right, and this thing is known, well, you can just solve for that explicitly, right? But if I use the other choice, if I use this thing, right, now I have an implicit solution. If it's linear, I can still solve for it explicitly. But as soon as I begin to get any kind of, as soon as this becomes any kind of nonlinear function, right, even without rate dependence, so say there's not a strain rate term in it, if this is a nonlinear function in, in EP and I choose it not at the previous time step, the known one, but at like this, then I'm guaranteed to have an implicit equation in delta lambda that I have to solve for numerically. And I have to do this at every stress integration point, every Gauss integration point in the entire simulation. And so you may give up a little bit of accuracy for speed in choosing it that way, okay? Um, whenever you have rate dependence, you better choose it this way or you're gonna get an unstable solution. And but what I mean, okay, to go back to what I was saying is, these will give different answers. And therefore, my linearization has to be consistent with the way I choose it. Right? If I can't, I can't linearize it about this and use it the other one. It has to be consistent with the return algorithm. Right? And and essentially, how you choose this, the, how you choose these parameters, and how you return it, you know, and then how you solve this, is your return algorithm. Because your return algorithm is you're solving for that, and then you're going to put yourself back on the yield surface. You're going to return yourself to the yield surface with this increment. Okay? So your linearization has to be consistent with the return algorithm for you to have quadratic convergence with Newton's method. All right. So then just to finalize, you know, we're typically we're, we're going to write our stress equation like a rate. So it'll be like C. So we're going to have rates. And so then if you break that up, you'll have and you know this, again, it's a strain driven problem. You, you apply some dis displacements, compute the strains, and then update the stress. So here this is known, so this is what you're solving for. And so with our return algorithm, you can solve for the stress, the deviatoric stress tensor at Sn plus 1 is the trial deviatoric stress tensor if the yield function is less than 0, a yield function evaluated with the trial strain. And it's 2 thirds y m plus 1 times q trial for f 
n plus 1 equals 0. All right, so basically, in words, that's just saying, remember, if f is less than 0, it's elastic. So your trial stress, which you evaluated with elasticity, is the deviatoric stress. Otherwise, it's this, where y at n plus 1 has been evaluated after solving for delta lambda. So you solve for delta lambda, then plug it back into y n plus 1, and then this is your new deviatoric stress. So then you can update the total stress. where P is the pressure. So this is for an isotropic case where you, you, just, you just have the bulk modulus. Right. So you know, if we go back and look at what our residual is, then you can think of this first term as like the internal forces, say minus the external forces. And your internal forces are going to be your B matrix times stress. Right? And remember, in the, in the case of elasticity, the stress is just C, B, right? So then you have, so for elasticity, you have B, C, B, D, right? So that's, nothing changes. But if you have plasticity, right, then you have to actually update this according to the return algorithm and plug that into this equation. And then your change of stiffness is KR U evaluated at U, okay? So it's, it can be really difficult. If you have a really complex plasticity model, it can be really difficult to derive a consistent, what are called consistent tangent moduli, or consistent tangent ma stiffness matrix in closed form for a given out return algorithm. You can do it, but it can be really tricky, and it's really beyond the scope uh, of this class to work on that. And that would be like in a, in a full course in plasticity, you might do that well. Um, what we'll do in this class is we'll just cheat. We'll just do it the easy way. And we'll compute this numerically with finite differences. Okay? So you can just, you can just evaluate the residual, right? The internal minus the external forces. You have the residual, right? So you just evaluate it and then you evaluate it at u, and then you just perturb, use a vector, right? So then just use a finite differences scheme but to perturb every entry of u. So you have you know, u plus some small perturbation in u uh, you know, times, let me just write it out. So, so u is a vector, right? So we'll have a, finite, a, f a forward finite difference approximation for the stiffness matrix would be R evaluated at U plus H E I minus R U all over H. So that would be a forward difference. So EI is going to be a basis vector that corresponds to every entry of U. So in other words, for the first degree of freedom in U, that would just be 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Yeah. And then it would 
be, for the second degree of freedom in you, it would be zero, one. Zero, 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 zero. And, uh, yeah, so this would be, you know, you could do, you could do central differences, whatever. Uh, e so each perturbation is going to give you one column of the stiffness matrix. And thankfully, we're not going to solve very big problems in this class because how big is the stiffness matrix? Number of nodes times number of nodes, right? So you have to do this finite difference calculation right, for every, you have to do it for every, um, for every node in the simulation just to get a column, right? And then, and then just to construct the whole thing, right? So there is some advantage to doing it, to finding out what it is in closed form, but for the purposes of this class, we're going to sw solve small enough problems that you know you can just implement this in a straightforward way. That way, you'll get you'll get uh, consistent tangent matrices, and you'll get uh, assuming that your step size is small, right? Then there's also the fact that if it's too small, you're subtracting a number that's really close to itself, and you can have subtractive cancellation problems. So there's, there's other ways, better ways to go about doing this. In fact, in the big production codes that I use nowadays, we use automatic differentiation to do this for us. So automatic differentiation is like a computer implementation. It's not the same as what Mathematica does. It's not symbolic differentiation. Automatic differentiation is a computer implementation of the chain rule. Right, so every time you can, you know, you you call sine, it stores cosine right next to it, and then at the end, for every function call you made, it it has its derivative stored there. It multiplies them all up, and gives you the exact two machine precision um, derivative. So it's it's pretty cool. So. Okay, so I uh, think that's all I'll talk about.